Good afternoon and welcome to uh, my Tech Days talk, which is titled Advanced MVVM Development in Windows 8. It is um, in the booklet, it is marked as a level 400 session. That will depend, of course, on your expertise in MVVM and Windows 8. So for some, it might be level 300. For some, it might be uh, a level 500, 600, or even beyond that. Um, the goal of this talk is, well, explaining you the more advanced concepts of MVVM, the things that uh, you're not seeing in the introductionary talks around MVVM, and things that you actually encounter in real life projects that you are solving with the MVVM pattern. Let me quickly introduce myself. So my name is uh, Gilles Kleren. I work at the Ordina as a .NET architect. I focus on XAML technologies. I've been doing XAML for many years now. Um, I'm also a Pluralsight trainer, Silverlight MVP, and a region director. You can find my blog and my uh, email on this slide as well. So uh, I will be posting the slides and the demos of this talk later, so you can review everything at your own pace. We have a very full agenda for this uh, talk. Um, I'm actually going to make sure that no one falls overboard. So I'm going to spend the first 10, 15 minutes giving you a very high speed overview of all the topics that surround and all the, uh, all the terminology that surround the MVVM pattern so that uh, you don't feel lost along the way. So that's going to take about 10, 15 minutes for the three first bullets. So thinking about modern UI, the link with modern UI and MVVM, the MVVM overview and the building blocks of MVVM. So that should take us about 10, 15 minutes. After that, we're going to dive deep in my sample application. I'm going to take you to the application architecture. I am going to show you uh, how I use dependency injection in my MVVM architecture. We're going to take a look at navigation, managing several windows in a Windows 8 application. I'm going to talk about data access and the repository pattern and how that fits in MVVM. We're going, to, we're going to see how we can use the typical Windows 8 controls, like the grid view and the semantic zoom in combination with an MVVM architecture. I'm going to show you how you can do contracts, again, in combination with MVVM, and the same for tiles, lifecycle management. And we're going to end by testing the entire architecture that we'll be using throughout this presentation. So it's quite a lot. We might have to skip one or two things. It depends uh, on, uh, on how much uh, I'm elaborating. So I'll try not to do that that much. Let's start by uh, making the link between modern UI and MVVM. If you think about modern UI, modern UI, uh, the previously known as Metro, but I'm not supposed to say that because I might get sued if I do. Um, so modern UI is the new way of building applications. Uh, it's a new uh, design language that Microsoft is introducing for all their applications. And if you think about modern UI, there's quite a number of concepts that, that are being moved forward that we didn't used to have to think about when building regular applications in, for example, WPF or Silverlight. For example, Windows 8 applications are all about content, not the Chrome. They're full screen. We can put them on the left or on the right in a split view or in a, in a field view, so in, the, in, in, in Windows 8 applications. If you don't want to full, uh, make them full screen, so can you put them in snap view? You can also um, come into a situation where your Windows 8 application has to be uh, reorientated. Huh? If the user is, or, uh, is rotating the screen, that also happens. We didn't have to use to think about uh, the fact that the user was going to rotate the screen. We didn't have to do that. That's all new. The same thing goes for navigation. Um, in Windows, in regular Windows application, we all had Windows and several dialogues and stuff like that in Windows 8. That's not the case anymore. We have now the concept of pages, and we need to navigate through and throughout our application by navigating from page one to page two. Also, the ways that the user is going to interact with an application is totally different. Uh, the user is going to use touch. He might, of course, still be using mouse and keyboard, and in many cases, he still will. But of course, we have to take that into account when building our Windows 8 applications. Also, because the fact that content is more important than Chrome, all the controls are going to be bundled in some locations. Like, for example, a way to interact is the charms bar, uh, so in combination with the contracts, and of course also the application bar. And uh, another concept is, of course, the life cycle. Uh, life cycle is totally new as well in Windows 8. We didn't have to um, think about the fact that Windows was going to close the application before. Now, uh, normally it was the user that, who closed the application. In Windows 8, Windows is actually taking control over the life cycle of an application. And also those things make building applications or, or, or make it that building applications for Windows 8 is a bit uh, different. Now, so modern UI is different, however, most of the applications that we're building for Windows 8 are built using XAML and C-Sharp or VB. Um, 
The concepts, however, between uh, what we used to do in, in XAML and, and C Sharp haven't changed. So if you've been building Silverlight applications, if you've been build, building Windows Phone applications, if you've been building WPF applications, conceptually, not that much has changed if you still choose to do it in XAML and C Sharp. The concept of MVVM is also supported on all three technologies. Conceptually, the, con the, the pattern hasn't changed. There are some new things, however, to think about. The things that I just explained, each technology has its specifics. Now, if you're building Windows 8 applications, you have to think about um, the fact that you have to do navigation differently, you have to think about the life cycle, you have to think about background tasks, managing the tasks, all those things are new. And that's the things that I'm gonna be focusing on in this talk. A good thing, however, is also that if you invest time in learning how to develop applications using MVVM and you want to move to HTML5 later on, well, the concept of the pattern is going to stay exactly the same if you move to HTML5, for example, if you're using Knockout.js. But I'm not going to focus on that. Of course, we're going to take a look at XAML. Now, so it is really a good idea to build your applications using MVVM and uh, the XAML and C Sharp languages because, as mentioned, you can really reuse a lot of your things that you already know from previous technologies. I'm going to quickly take you through a couple of slides that give you a very high level overview of the pattern. Then we're going to take a look at the more advanced stuff. So what is MVVM? MVVM is in fact nothing more than a pattern. It stands for the model view view model pattern. And it is actually based on the presentation model, which is invented by Fowler. And then the MVC pattern flowed out of that one. And then MVVM is basically an evolution of that. And you see here John Gossman, who is actually the inventor of the MVVM pattern. Uh, he was one of the guys that originally developed WBF way back in the 2005, 2006, 2007 timeframe. And he actually, uh, invented uh, what we still know as the MVVM pattern. Now, the MVVM pattern really is based on the concepts or the, or the concepts that XAML is bringing us. Things like data binding, things like commanding are concepts of the XAML language, and MVVM is actually basing itself on those things. It's really lever leveraging the framework concepts that it brings us. It became popular with Silverlight. I'm a Silverlight MVP, I still love Silverlight, and actually what I learned in Silverlight is perfectly applicable in Windows 8. It became popular with Silverlight, people started building applications in WPF using MVVM as well, but it became mainstream with Silverlight. Also many applications for Windows Phone have been, have been built using the MVVM pattern, and now Windows 8 is going the same way. What it's mainly all about is a separation between what the designer is doing and what the developer is doing. I, I do uh, real life applications. I know that that separation is not always that clear. You don't always have a designer on your team. But however, the, the main goal is splitting up what your design work is gonna be and what your code work is gonna be and ending up with a much more testable and maintainable architecture. And we haven't been doing that. We haven't actually been building applications that way for many years. We have been building applications in which we had uh, in which we had uh, the, the code and the, the UI code, the actual code behind, and the code in the, same, uh, in the same place. We have been doing quite a lot of stupid things in the past, and um, like you see here, uh, we've been sh trying to shoot ducks, uh, ducks for many years as well, and we've been building our code in a very bad way. Not really bad, but in a mainly less testable way. And this is what we have been doing. We've been building code the view was actually containing XAML and code behind. And that XAML and code behind was okay. It, yeah, it, it, it works, of course. But the code in the code behind goes directly to the data model. And if you want to test that code that lives in code behind, that contains yeah, the regular event handling stuff, it's going to be very hard. Because that code is really dependent on the XAML, on the view code. And the UI elements are, by definition, very hard to mock out and very hard to test in separation. So it hasn't been all that good to test things. Now, in 2013, we became smart, huh? and we've been doing things in a much better way. Not everything has been improved, but the way that we can write code has definitely improved. What you see here is basically the concept of writing code in MVVM. As you can see, you still have your XAML code. Nothing really changed in that XAML part. However, that XAML code is now binding itself to what is called, or what is known as the view model. And that view model is basically exposing state and operations so that the view can bind on it. And you still see code behind. There is still code behind, but the code behind is really limited. I am not saying that there shouldn't be any code in the code behind. There should be code in the code behind, but it, should, it shouldn't be code that can or should be tested. In other words, it should not be code that interacts with the model. 
And the view model, which exposes state under the form of properties and operations under the form of commands, it is bound to by the view. And then the view model is the one that will directly interact with the model. It will not, there will never be a direct line that goes from the view or the code behind to the model. You will never have that. Now, the building blocks of MVVM, if you look at the word MVVM, the view is, of course, the visual part. That is the XAML that will contain data binding co uh, code that binds on the, co on the state and operations which are exposed by the view model. It's very, it should be very clean, it should be very simple. As mentioned, there can be code in the code behind. It is not a sin to put code in the code behind. Now, what code should you be putting in your code behind? Well, code that interacts with the view that should be in the code behind. So things like setting a focus, maybe an animation even, that, can, that is not the that is not the business of the, of the view model, that is purely view code. So that should definitely be in your view. And we're going to see in the sample later that I have some code in my code behind as well, and I don't mind that because it's code that definitely doesn't uh, interact with my model. Then you have the view model, and the view model is basically the glue between your view and your model. It sits between those two layers. It, um, it contains state under the form of properties, and it also contains commands under the form, uh, sorry, it, it contains uh, ways of interacting with the data model under the form of commands, uh, and those are the operations. Um, in your view model, you should never have any code that does stuff with the view uh, elements directly. So if you ever have, uh, uh, if you, and I've seen that, I've seen people do that. Yes, there are people that actually manage to have view elements directly in their view model, and that should never happen, because then probably you're doing something in a not very good way. Now, why should you make this view model? Why should you create it? Because this view model will make sure that the view can bind uh, on it, and it can be tested. It can be maintained in isolation. You don't really have to change the view if you're changing something in the view model. So it becomes testable, and it becomes much more maintainable. And it is the thing that will interact with the model. And then your model, well, your model can be data classes, can be DTOs. It could be a proxy generated by, uh, from, from a service reference. In many cases, it's not a good idea to directly bind on uh, or directly take your model as being the, uh, the proxy. That's most often not a very good thing. In many cases, you still write a layer on top of it, and that is going to be your model. The model never knows the view model. The view model never knows the view, but the other way, the, the, the components know each other. So the view knows who is this view model, and the view model knows who, which is this model, but not the other way around. Now, how do they actually know that? How do we link the view and the view model? Well, there are several ways of doing that, and of course, they still they, they do have to know each other because otherwise, the view cannot bind upon the view model. So it has to know its view model. Now, uh, and then the view model is going to be uh, set using the data context, and it's going to be set as the data context for the entire view. Now, how do they actually know each other? You can do that in two ways. You can do that in a, in a dynamic way or in a static way. A static way basically means that in your XAML, you're going to say, well, this is going to be the view model for this particular view. And you can do it in a dynamic way, which basically means that you're going to do it at runtime. You're going to push in that view model in some way so that the view knows what to bind to. And that works as well. You can do, uh, you can do the two ways. Um, there's also two ways of doing it. There's two options of doing it. You can do a view first, or you can do a view model first. And as the word says it, well, the view first will actually have the view created first, and then the view model is going to be created uh, afterwards. Or you can do the view model first, which actually creates the view model first, and then uh, the view is going to be selected. Now, that's the theory of doing it. Uh, how do you, you practically do this? Well, most of the time, and um, MVVM Lite uh, it, uh, is also using this, it's a locator pattern. The locator pattern is a really simple way of allowing my view and my view model to be uh, working together and, and, and finding each other, I should say. So the view model locator, it, it basically is based on the locator pattern, which, says, uh, which is a class that will help you find the components that you're looking for. It basically locates things. So the view model locator is a class that exposes all the view models in your application as a property. And in your views can say to your view model locator, well, give me now this particular view model. Your view model locator is often created once in your application as a resource, which makes sure that that is created uh, up front. And we're going to see that in the demo in just a second. The view model locator pattern is, uh, for some applications, not a really good solution. Um, I must say that was that used to be the case if you're building if you were building WPF applications or Silverlight applications that mainly used something like an MDI interface or a multiple document interface, which uh, which requires that your your, uh, your view models have been created dynamically, which is not really possible using the view model locator. However, you can do that using a view model locator, and then you have to use some form of IOC, and we're going to use that later on as well. 
Now, we shouldn't have any code in the code behind that interacts with the model. So we shouldn't have any event handlers in the code behind. But how can we fix things then? Well, we have to use the command pattern. Now, the command pattern and the command itself is basically a class that, let's say, encapsulates everything to make sure that at some later time an, uh, a method can be called. That's what a command is. And that's what the command pattern is itself is also saying. Now, in, uh, in, uh, in Windows 8, in WinRT, we have the iCommand interface. And the iCommand interface is a very simple interface that has three things. It has a, an execute, a can execute, and a can execute changed. The execute is the, will contain the code in your command implementation that you will want to execute when some event in the UI has triggered. So it's going to execute on the view model. The can execute is a boolean that will uh, return true or false whether or not that command can be executed. And a can execute changed is an event that will be raised when the value of that can execute has to be changed. That's very simple. It's a very simple interface. Now, that interface, however, um, you can implement it yourself. You can implement uh, an instance of this. Uh, so you can uh, create an implementation of this and then instantiate that on the view model and let your view model bind. Uh, sorry, let your view bind on this command implementation. I'm not doing that myself. I'm using the uh, relay command of MVVM Lite. Um, we're going to use MVVM Lite, but you can do it, uh, of course, without MVVM Lite as well and do it yourself. Now, the thing is, commanding in the view, so binding on a specific command that is exposed by the view model, is only possible on several, on, on, actually I should say, a very limited amount of controls. Only controls that, that are deriving from button base, and that's basically things like the button and the checkbox. For other controls, you cannot use the command property. They don't exist, they, the command property doesn't exist for all controls. But for example, if you then want to uh, do a command binding on a, on a, a Dropbox, uh, not a Dropbox, a uh, selection, a uh, list box, let's say, and you want to bind on a selection, changed, how are you going to do that? You have to use something uh, known as behaviors. And a behavior is, in fact, a block of code that can be attached on, uh, on any SAML element. And originally, uh, behaviors were invented uh, in combination with Blend, so that uh, a block of code could be reused and could actually be dragged and dropped by a designer on a particular element. That's where behaviors are coming from. Now, it turns out that, um, that behaviors itself it's a concept that can be used for many things, including allowing binding on commands, on command properties that, uh, on controls that don't really support the command. Now, you could fix that in uh, Silverlight and, w and, and in Windows Home by using behaviors. Now, behaviors are not supported in Windows 8. So again, we have to look for something else. And the, the answer is, in fact, uh, available to an open source library, which is called WinRT Behaviors, written by Joost van Schaik, and it's available as a NuGet package that still allows you to actually bind on a command uh, that is exposed on your view model on whatever event that you have. And that's what you see here. For example, we're using uh, the, the uh, tapped event on a particular control, on a text block control here, using that particular WinRT Behaviors. And in, uh, internally, the WinRT Behaviors makes use of the attached behaviors, but that's not really that important. You can still use it out of the box like this. So nothing is really changing. Now, the last thing I want to explain before we go to the deep dive is messaging. Now, we're talking about the fact that view model and the view model pattern is trying to, to let you build more testable code. And creating testable code is dependent on the fact that if you can test things in isolation or not. Now, if you build your application, you're going to end up with many view models. And if your view models are going to have to communicate with each other, it's going to end up a bit like a spaghetti. Because what you're going to do is you're going to create a reference from view model A in view model B, and that has to go to view model C. And in the end, you get a big spaghetti of linked view models. You shouldn't be doing that. You should use another way of, uh, of uh, letting these view models communicate. And the best way of doing that is using an event aggregator or a mediator that sits in between. So here we have a couple of view models. The view model on the left here wants to do stuff with the other view models. Instead of creating a link, instead of creating a reference in that view model and uh, to the other two view models, we're not going to do that. We're going to use an event aggregator that sits in between. What we're going to do is we're going to send the message from that one to the event aggregator, and all the other view models that are interested in knowing what the other view model is saying are going to subscribe with that event aggregator. 
It's basically a simple pub sub model. That one is going to publish messages. All the other ones that are interested in receiving those messages simply register with that event aggregator and are going to be notified when something interesting is happening. And that's what you see here. So this one is going to say it's going to send the message to the event aggregator, and then the other ones are going to be automatically notified about that particular event happening. And without actually creating hard links between my view models in my application. So that's basically the very high-level overview of uh, MVVM. Now we're going to uh, switch gears a bit, and I'm going to take a look at a real-life application. Now before we take a look at the application and the demo, and we're going to use that demo for the entire application, uh, for the entire presentation, I'm sorry, we're going to take a look at some goals that I have set for this application. Before we actually start building an application, it's really interesting to think about what you want to achieve with the architecture. And one of the things I want to achieve in, this, uh, in the, uh, the way that I build my applications is separation of concerns. The SOC, uh, the SOC principle, or the separation of concerns principle, basically says, well, let's try building components that are not dependent on each other, that can be tested in isolation without being dependent on other um, uh, components that we cannot mock out. We're, gonna, we're always going to have references from the one to the other component, but if we want to test them, it must be very easy to test them in isolation. Now, the separation of concerns also says, well, every component should do exactly one thing. It is not a good uh, idea to create a view model that does data access, that will send tile updates, that will, send, uh, that will implement a contract. That's not a very good idea, because then that view model becomes so heavy that, it, again, it does many more things than what it is supposed to do, and that is not a good thing. So think about separation of concerns. Everything, every task that you're actually building, that you're actually creating, should be a separate class. It doesn't cost a thing to create a new class, so why don't we do it? So that separation of concerns thing is something that I'm going to refer to quite a lot uh, of times during the rest of the talk. Now, I'm also using the repository pattern, and the repository pattern, I'm going to uh, show it later how I'm using that, is basically, again, um, creating less dependencies. I don't want to create dependencies between my several components. I don't want to have my view model to be dependent on my data access. So I'm going to put a repository uh, in the middle. And the main goal of all these things is actually loose coupling. Don't create hard links, don't create hard references between your indiv individual components, but make it, possible for, uh, to make it possible to switch easily between your implementations and therefore also make it easy to make them testable and make them mockable. I'm going to do that. I'm going to, create, I'm going to set that up using, independency, using dependency injection as the pattern, and I'm using for that an IOC container. I'm going to use a dependency injection container or DI container that will create my instances for me and also, again, will, will help me achieve that loose coupling. I'm going to show that in the first bullet after I've shown you the demo. And in the end, of course, is... Uh, the main goal is creating an application that is much more easily testable, that's much more easily maintainable, and that I can, if I want to make it testable, it should be easy to mock uh, individual components out. Uh, even if I create uh, individual components, if, even if I use the separation of concerns principle, it should still be possible to mock out the dependencies that I'm creating. So that are the main goals of the application architecture. Let us now take a look at the demo. The demo that I'm going to use is Contoso Cookbook. People, probably many people have seen the Contoso Cookbook. It is the, the uh, ultimate goal of building the hands or of, of finishing the hands-on labs. And in the Contoso Cookbook, um, it's a great application. Huh? Frankly, it's, it's a very good lab, but it, it is not focused on building anything with MVVM. It, it tries to help you learn everything that surrounds Windows 8 and not MVVM. So what I've done, I've rebuilt um, uh, the Contoso Cookbook from scratch, now using MVVM. So um, the end result is, of course, exactly the same. It's the same application, but I'm going to use MVVM to make things work. All right. So I'm going to show you uh, that very quickly. So uh, I have it open here. For the people who have never seen uh, the Contoso Cookbook, this is Contoso Cookbook. I'm loading the data uh, locally, so from a, a text file. So that's one of the options you have. You can click on uh, an individual recipe that has a flip view that allows you to, swip, uh, to, to flip through the individual uh, uh, recipes. You can also click on a header here that takes you to the detail page of that, um, uh, that type of, of recipe groups. That's a recipe group, that, in fact. And you can also do things like sharing. So you can share a recipe to make sure that uh, people create this or that you send this to your friends or something. So everything that is originally in Contoso Cookbook is in fact implemented here as well, but in a way that I think is much better using MVVM. So let's take a look at how we can do this. So I am going to 
show you the code very quickly. Um, in fact, I cannot show you all the code, of course. Um, I, I advise you to download it afterwards. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the uh, solution structure. And of course, we're going to dive in the individual items that are uh, quite important to, uh, throughout uh, the rest of the talk. So if we take a look at the individual components, we have the Contoso Cookbook app. That is the Windows 8 application. And in that Contoso app itself, we have the views which contains XAML, of course, nothing to see here, if, uh, apart from the fact that this has a data context over here and it's binding to a particular view model. And in the code behind, I have not a lot of code. I do have a lot of code. It is not uh, a sin to have code in my code behind, but uh, the code that is in here is actually view code. And we're gonna take a look at that code later on when we look at the data binding. Then um, in my um, application itself, there's also that view model locator and that view model, whoops, that view model locator uh, uses the DI container indirectly, but we're going to take a look at that later on. So if you know IOC, you see that I'm registering all the types that I'm using throughout my application. Again, take, taking a look at that in just a second. And then my view model locator, as explained, exposes a property of each view model so that my views can actually bind on it. And so here you see that I'm, for example, using the recipe group view model, which is the, the landing page. And so I, I'm exposing that view model uh, as a property on my view model locator. Let's take a look at the next project. So the next project is this contracts property. To create... Um, uh, uh, sort of a, an, in, an indirectness uh, to create that, uh, that uh, easy uh, mocking and that easy use it te uh, unit testing. I'm not going to create hard references, so I'm not going to uh, develop against, in, uh, against classes. I'm going to develop against interfaces. And then using my DI container, I'm going to uh, put in the, uh, the, the real classes in my implementation. So here you see in the contracts project, I have all kinds of interfaces. I have interfaces for the model, for the services that we'll be using, Again, that we'll see later, for the view models and as well for the views. So everything is in fact an interface. So I don't have any, I'm not developing against the concrete implementations. Then we have the messages. So that is the messages that are going back and forth between the view models. We're not going to take a look at those. Then we have the model. Uh, in fact, the model is really simple. I think that is one of the things I, that I uh, copied from the original application. Uh, it has a recipe and a recipe group, but it might be easier to take a look at it here. So if we take a look at a recipe group, so the recipe group has um, an observable collection of recipes. It's, of course, still a demo. So the data is already in a format that is, of course, much more easily uh, binding to. So it's, it has a, a collection of recipes, an observable collection of recipes. And so the recipe itself has things like a title, an image source, a prep time, and stuff like that. So that is the model that we're going to be using throughout the rest of the talk. Then uh, I have my service, uh, so server and services we're going to skip. That is uh, not part of this, uh, uh, of, uh, this demo. Service client, uh, I'm not really going to use any services. There were services in here to use push notifications. Uh, the service client, however, is a way of, again, making sure that I'm not really creating dependencies inside of my code. So the service client contains all service references to WCS services or whatever, so that I'm not, I'm not scattering those throughout my project. I'm putting them all in one project. And whenever I have uh, references needed to WCF service, I actually can reference my other projects to this service client. Again, we're not going to take a look at that in more detail. We are going to take a look in much detail at the services project and the classes that live in there. There's many services in here that we're going to take a look at uh, later on. Things like sharing, like tiles, they are going to be a service. Then we have the shared. The shared actually contains a class that is important when we look at the DI, so the instance factory. And then we have the view models. And in fact, I have a very simple application which has the one-to-one -one relation between the views and the view models. So every view has exactly one view model. Some applications require you to have one view model for several views or one view that has several view models. This is a very simple application, one view, one view model. And we're going to bind on this. If we take a look at, for example, the recipe group overview view model that contains state and operations in the form of uh, properties, so recipe groups, and these commands are my uh, commands I'm going to be binding to. I use here MVVM Lite, so the relay command, I could have used my own M uh, command implementation. All right, so that is the architecture. And let's now take a look at some more details on how we built this. 
So um, I'm using a DI container, or an IOC container, depending on how you want to say it. The DI container is a very important aspect in my application, because I want to keep things uh, very loosely coupled, and I can only do that by creating, uh, by, by not uh, de uh, developing against my uh, concrete implementations, but using my interfaces. And I'm going to use my DI container to register my types with my container, so that I, when I'm actually uh, using the, or when I'm running the code, my container can deliver inside of my uh, implementations the create implementations instead of the interfaces. I am not using what MVVM Lite offers by default. It offers a simple IOC. Um, it works. It works perfectly. But I find it a bit too limited in, in, uh, in the ways that I can, can um, manage the, the lifetimes of the individual objects. So I went on to NuGet and I searched for some other uh, DI containers that actually work with Windows 8. And I found a couple. I, used Met uh, I actually used Metro IOC. There's something called Tiny IOC. Uh, Autofac also uh, supports Windows 8. Um, I used Metro IOC. Why? I don't know. It offered me what I needed, so that's why I picked it. I tested it a bit, and it's actually uh, quite, well, uh, quite good. And I actually use my DI container to manage basically everything. So all my dependencies, my services, my view models, my views are all maintained by my DI container. Now, my container is used to create a loose coupling in my application. Now, would it, wouldn't it be very ironic to create a hard dependency on your container I think so. So what I'm not doing is creating a hard dependency on my container, but I'm actually creating an, another abstraction layer on top of my container, so that when I going to uh, change my containers. It might be that at some point I say, uh, that Metro IOC, I don't like it anymore. I'm going to use a different container. So I'm not going to use my, my container inside of my code directly. You know, instead, I'm going to develop against an, uh, against an abstraction layer that I'm going to use, and that is going to expose a couple of interesting things so that my DI container is not referenced throughout my code. I'm basically, again, creating an abstraction layer for the container. Let me show you how I'm doing that. So the container is mainly uh, filled up from the view model locator because I know that is actually going to be called uh, in, uh, very early in the application creation. So in the view model locator, let's go to the app itself. In the view model locator, I am going to use the instance factory register type where I actually uh, register my, my interface with the concrete implementation. Um, that instance factory itself, if you can read it, is not part of Metro IOC. It is part of the code that I've written. But if we take a look at that thing, we can see that the instance factory is in fact my abstraction layer on top of my container that allows me to have all the interactions with my container in just one place instead of scattering it throughout my code. So this I container is the, the actual code, the actual code of Metro IOC. If I de decide on changing Metro IOC, I simply have to do it in this particular class and not in uh, all my other classes. So here you see the instantiation of the container, and it contains a couple of things. So register type, register with transient lifetime. Uh, no, in, in, in this application, I've used singletons for every uh, uh, view model and, and, and uh, service. I could have used transients. Uh, they, they simply specify on, on how the container will return your new objects. If you have a singleton, it will always return you the same view model or the same concrete implementation. If you have uh, a transient lifetime, every time you request a new instance, it will give you back a new one. I could have used the, sing the uh, transients for the detail pages. I haven't done that. Uh, I've done it differently, but again, it's, it is not a perfect solution. It's just a way of doing things. Now, how do I then use my view model? Uh, sorry, my... Um, my uh, container. Let's take a look in the uh, recipe group overview. So here, for example, my recipe group overview view model uh, uses a recipe data service, a dialogue service, and a navigation service. I'm not giving it directly. No, I'm using my container instead. So I'm saying, instance factory, please return me an instance of something that you have that implements the iNavigation service. And it will push in the concrete implementation. Again, I could have used uh, constructor injection for this. Perfect, Good, uh, that would have worked as well. I've done it this way. Uh, we'll see later in the unit testing that this is actually a really easy way of doing things. So that's why I use my DI container, to, to achieve that uh, loose coupling inside of my application. The next thing I want to show you is navigation. Now, navigation is something that really changed in Windows 8. Uh, normally, we would have had uh, applications that, uh, WPF for example, that have new windows to convey information. Uh, in Windows 8, that 
completely changed. We, ha we now have the concept of pages and the concept of a frame. And when we use content to navigate, we are navigating to other pages instead of other, uh, instead of other windows. That's how we're going to do things. Um, in Windows 8, many of the windows are very wide, so you have to scroll quite a lot, but also all pages. So, in fact, it, it more or less uses a model that is, let's say, pretty similar to a web page and to the, to the web itself. So every application has at its root a root frame, and that frame is set at the application startup. And that frame is also the thing that allows you to navigate from page one to page two and back and forth. It has, it has methods for that. It has, for example, the uh, go back. It has the navigate that allows you to navigate to another uh, page in your application. In fact, the navigation in Windows 8 is uh, navigating to types, and you can pass a parameter. So you don't really have to say you have to go to this URI, but you instead say navigate to this particular type. Now. How do we do navigation then? The thing is, we have one root frame inside of our application, and we are not going to say, you know what, I'm going to uh, let my view models navigate. In fact, my view models are concerned with the flow of my application. That is true. A view model will say, well, the user has executed this command, now we need to go to that particular uh, view. That is true. Now, if you would make, if you would create a reference inside of your view models to the frame, remember what I said in the beginning, you should never have any visual elements referenced inside of your view models. You want to test your view models in the end. So if you want to test them and you have a dependency on the frame, well, that becomes quite hard to mock it. So it's, it's going to be, you're going to create a dependency on that frame. So we're not going to do that. Is it then the job of the view to create, in fact, that, uh, that, that nav or to perform that navigation? Well, no, because the view in, in an MVM situation doesn't really know when we should be navigating. So it's not part of the view. It's not part of, of the, part of the task of the view, not part of the task of the view model, and of course not of the model either. So whose task is it then? Well, the answer is very simple. We should create what is known as, as a separate service class. And as uh, you've seen those services in the services project, the navigation service is one of these. The navigation service is a separate class, think separation of concerns, that allows you to do the navigation. That will have a dependency on the frame, that will have a dependency on that, uh, that uh, visual element, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's my view models that I actually want to test in separation, and I have my, my separate service, and that contains something I can test uh, much less easily. So uh, that navigation service, I'm going to manage through my DI container. So basic, uh, most of the times I create one instance of the navigation service at application level, so in my DI container, and then it's passed into my view models using my DI container. Before we take a look at the demo, Windows, if you have more than one window, um, it, it doesn't really happen that much in Windows 8. You mostly navigate to another uh, page. Huh? You cannot really say, I'm going to create a new window. But you can have situations where you would, for example, create a message dialogue, a confirmation dialogue, an error dialogue. Those things really still exist. And again, those are visual elements. You don't want to have them in your view model. What you want is to have a separate service that manages those uh, different uh, individual windows. And that service, again, is pushed in the DI container and it is called from my view model. Let's take a look at the navigation part. So I have in my application, in the services project, so in the services project, this one, I have this class called the navigation service. And the navigation service, it contains, as I mentioned, in, uh, by the way, it implements the iNavigation service interface, and it contains a reference to the frame class. Uh, again, this is not a problem. This is an individual class. It's not my view model. It's an individual class that I make dependent on a visual element, the frame. I have this navigated in here that uh, allows me to call some initialization of my view model. Coming back to, just, to that in just a second. And then I have my navigate methods. This is a very simple application. It only contains a couple of views. So I can do my navigation based on the type that I want to navigate to. So that's what I'm doing here. So in this navigate uh, overload, I, I pass in the type and a parameter, and I then call this, uh, this generic uh, navigate that accepts the type that I want to navigate to. And that will then call this frame.navigate. So my entire navigation stack is managed through this navigation service. I also have, as mentioned, the um, on navigated to, over, on frame navigated. Sorry, the on frame navigated will be called when the actual navigation to the f to the new page has finished, allowing me to call on my view model uh, some form of initialization. If you need to do this, for example, go out to a service and, and check uh, check authentications or stuff like that, that you can actually do from here. 
All right, then the, um, how does my, my data service get this dependency uh, pushed in, gets this frame pushed in? Well, in my app XAML, so in the code behind of the uh, app, or oh, code behind, not really code behind, but in the app XAML.cs, I have this, um, this code here that, um, that gets to my DI container an instance of the navigation service. And as mentioned in the slides, there is one frame created uh, by Windows, that's the root frame. That's where all your pages are gonna be hosted in. So that, root, that the root frame is created over here. And then I say to do navigation service, this frame, the, the frame that you need in your frame to navigate is that root frame. So then my navigation service is all right. And then my view models, as mentioned, are concerned with the flow of the application. So if they need to navigate to a particular view, so in the recipe group overview, so when I click on an individual recipe, I want to do navigation. So I'm going to say navigation service dot navigate. Navigate to a particular string, and that is then uh, translated into a particular type. And the navigation service, as we saw already, is uh, received here in this, uh, in this uh, view model by simply asking the DI container. That's how I do navigation. And the same goes, for example, as I mentioned, for the dialogues. I have this dialogue service in here, which does things like showing message dialogues, uh, shows delete confirmation, stuff like that. Again, all bundled in this one service that does one thing, separation of concerns, making sure that my view models are not dependent on visual elements. All right, let's go back to the slides and let's take a look at how we can work with data. So data access, almost every Windows 8 application, not every Windows 8 application, but many applications will have to access data somehow. Um, is it the job of your view model to go out and get the data? It is talking to the model, that's true. But um, is it a good thing to directly talk with the, with the data access code? Well, no. I'm going to add a few layers in between that make things, again, a bit more cleaner. The first thing I'm going to do is add a repository. And if you look up the repository pattern on the internet, probably on Wikipedia or something, you're going to find that it is a pattern that allows you to uh, create an abstraction between your data persistence code and your data consumer code. So basically saying don't create, uh, or don't have your consumer of your data access code directly uh, call uh, the data access code, but create a layer, the repository that contains the data access code and talk to that thing. Now, in most cases, the repository is then uh, directly responsible for the data access. It is the thing that will retrieve the data. It is basically transparent for the consumer of that repository where the data is coming from. So the repository is also a good, um, a good location to do your caching, for example. If you, for example, need to go to a service and you want to cache that data, do that in the repository. The repository would, for example, check first if you have a copy of the data locally, and if it doesn't find it, then go out to the service. But the consumer of your data doesn't have to know that you have to look locally and then go to a service. No, it just needs the data. That's the task of the repository. A repository often manages one single resource collection. So think parent-child. So uh, the recipe groups with the recipes. That's what we're going to use one repository for. Again, this is just a demo. I only have one, uh, one parent-child relation in my model. In a real uh, application, if I am, we would, for example, have things like an invoice, an invoice line. That would be managed by one single repository. Now, of course, in real-life applications, the, the data model is not that simple, and you're not going to have a very clean separation of your data, uh, of your model entities, and, and have that data access really clean. You're, you're going to end up with, of course, an extra business layer that combines the responses of those several view model of those several repositories. And that is where a data service comes in. A data service will be the thing that your view model will talk to. Because it, it would not be a good idea to let your view model go out and talk to your several repositories. Imagine that you would have a repository for invoices and another repository for users. And then your view model would actually have to go to the repository of the invoices and to the repository of the users and combine that response. Is that a good idea? No because the view model simply has to make sure its task is only to get the data re uh, ready for the view to bind on. It is not concerned with going out to the data repositories. It wants to ask someone, give me the data, and then make it uh, usable for the view. And then there is your data service. Uh, that's where your data service comes into play. So the data service is per unit of functionality. Uh, that could be get me back all the invoices, and there could be user details in, so there could be several, user, uh, several repositories be uh, involved in this scenario. Often I have one data service per functionality, again managed per 
um, by my, uh, in my DI container. Let me show you. Again, this is um, this not really that good implemented in the application because the data model is pretty simple. So the only thing uh, I think I copied uh, from the original uh, Contoso cookbook is the repository. So if we take a look at the repository uh, for the recipes, we have this recipe repository, which uh, will return an uh, observable collection of uh, recipe groups, or will contain, a, I'm sorry, a, 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 an observable collection of recipe groups. And that will be returned when we ask this load recipes. And that load recipes, in this case, goes to a local file, but that could, for example, first check the cache, and if it doesn't find the data in the cache, then go out to the service, and then perhaps cache the data as well. And in the end, the consumer of this repository will get back the data. It is completely oblivious to where it, the data is being retrieved. Then the data service, that is this uh, recipe data service, oh, this, sorry, this one. So that recipe data service, I manage it uh, by uh, using my container, so I have an interface on this thing again. And that does things like, for example, getting back all the recipe groups. And it uses directly the recipe repository. In this case, it is like more a one-to-one -one mapping. In real-life applications, you're going to end up talking to many repositories here. My view model is not talking to the repositories directly. No, it is talking to the data service. So the recipe group overview view model has this recipe data service. Uh, it, it regist it's registered uh, in the container. It was retrieved via, uh, from the container. And then in the call over here, I can say recipe data service dot get all recipe groups. One important thing I haven't mentioned here yet is the fact that my data service should expose an asynchronous API. That is important because otherwise my view models can only use it in a, in a non-asynchronous way, so in a synchronous way, that's not good because they, they are concerned with the, with the flow of the application, so the, 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 the fact that things have to keep on uh, moving. So if we uh, would do this, if we would develop the um, data service in a synchronous way, the view model would actually end up uh, blocking the entire application, so that's not allowed. You should make sure that your data service contains uh, tasks or will return tasks so that your view model can actually use the await a sync pattern on it. All right, so that is how I do my data access. Now, once I have my data access, uh, my data ready, I need to use it somewhere. And we can use data binding to use, uh, to use the data in combination with the great new Windows 8 controls. So Microsoft has thought of the fact that much, uh, many types of data are available as lists of data. Uh, things like uh, an RSS feed, a Twitter feed, Flickr images, even local files, they're all lists of data. And that is why Microsoft included in Windows 8 a couple of interesting list controls. Uh, so uh, that is the grid view, the list view, the flip view, and the semantic zoom. And once you have your data, data on the view model, you will be able to bind on it. And I'm going to quickly show you how you can do that in combination with the MVVM pattern again. So I'm going to start with the grid view and then we're going to add a semantic zoom uh, on top of it. So the grid view is binding, uh, if, you look, if you look at uh, the application again, we are using a grouped grid view, so a, a list of groups basically. Um, if you see here, so we have the recipe group Chinese, and we have the recipe group uh, Indian. So it's basically a list of lists, like the original uh, Contoso application. And uh, so the data itself that I'm going to feed it is indeed also a list of lists. If you remember how the data was structured, demo, uh, so um, not always like a real life application, but if you look at the recipe group, that recipe group indeed contains somewhere over here, an observable collection of recipes. So I have my parent-child relation, the, observe, the recipe groups will be my groups, and then the individual recipes will be the recipes inside of the recipe groups. So if we take a look at the view model, so the recipe group overview view model, that indeed contains at the very top an observable collection of I recipe groups. So I can bind on that, perfect. So in the view, that will give us the following. So opening the view here, recipe group view. <coughs> so in here I have the, uh, I start with a collection view source and I'm gonna bind that on recipe groups. And that recipe groups is indeed this observable collection of uh, exposed on my view model. And I also add this items part recipes that allows me to know which will be my property that I can dig into for the individual items. So that is in the collection view source. And then we have the grid view. The grid view is binding to the grouped items view source. So that is the view source I just showed you. It will bind on the groups because I'm actually going to create it as a grouped grid view. 
So in here, in the code, in the XAML code for this, um, this grid view, I have, I'm going to create an items panel which contains a virtualizing stack panel. That is for the individual groups. So the groups are going to be placed next to each other. As you can see, the orientation of this thing is set to horizontal, which will make sure that the groups are placed horizontally. And then I also define a group style which contains at the top a button. The button is the actual uh, group name that I can click on to go to the group detail page. So that uh, button is then binding to an individual recipe group. And so indeed I'm binding to the title, which is available as a property on the recipe group. I also have this uh, variable sized rep grid to specify how an individual group is going to be visualized. So how the individual items are gonna be visualized. That's what you have here. That works absolutely perfect from an MVVM scenario. If however, you, what you need, do need to do however, is making sure that your view model will expose the data in a form that is easily bindable to by the view. If you want to add semantic zoom on top, well, semantic zoom for the people who've never seen semantic zoom, it is the, the thing that allows you to go to a high level view of large sets of data. If you have a large set of data and the user has to, has to flick through all that list, uh, that, that large list of data, it might be a bit annoying to, uh, to, uh, for the user. So you're gonna add a semantic zoom. Semantic zoom allows you to go into a bird's eye perspective of your data, allowing to uh, show, for example, only the groups. And then the user can tap on a group and zoom into that particular group. The uh, semantic zoom can actually contain two things. Um, for both the zoomed out view and the zoomed in view, you can put in something that implements the iSemantic zoom interface. The iSemantic zoom interface is currently only implemented by the list view and the grid view. So you can place only in that semantic zoom uh, either a list view or a grid view. So most of the time you see people using two grid views. You can however use the list view as well. You cannot place something else in there. This is also the reason why you cannot put in a semantic zoom other semantic zoom because the semantic zoom doesn't implement the iSemantic zoom interface. So this is how it looks, for example, so you have uh, here on the right, you have uh, the, the zoomed out view, so the, the, the bird's eye perspective, and when you tap on an individual group, you're gonna zoom into the items that uh, are uh, available in that particular group. Now this comes with a bit of a problem um, to use this in combination with MVVM, but it's uh, very easily solvable. So um, remember we had the collection view source at the top, huh? And then um, we had that grid view here that was binding to that collection view source. Around that collection, uh, sorry, around that grid view, I have this semantic zoom. In the zoomed in view, that's the one I just showed you. Huh? Nothing changes there. If we take a look at the zoomed out view, so the bird's eye perspective, you see that there is no item source set for this particular grid view. The, the semantic zoom is not, let's say, smart enough I'm, I'm gonna leave it in the middle whether or not this should be there or not. It doesn't know that uh, which are gonna be the groups that it has to bind to. You have to set that again separately. So as you see, there's no data binding statement in this group uh, grid view uh, declaration. And now if we go to the code behind, I'm gonna have to make sure that my uh, zoomed out grid view knows what it has to bind to. And here I am using code in my code behind. And as mentioned before, this is not a problem. This is view code. It, yeah, it works with data coming back from the model, but it's not asking the model, please get me that data or do something with that data. No, the data is already there. It's exposed by the view model. And then I'm changing something in my view. I'm changing the group, the group grid view, its item source property to the group grid, the grouped items view sources views dot collection groups. And that is going to be the groups of the, uh, basically the uh, recipe groups that I'm going to bind to. This is code that should be in your code behind. It's not a problem, it is perfectly uh, possible because this is regular view code. That's how I do data binding on the most commonly used Windows 8 list controls in uh, Windows 8. Let's take a look at contracts. A contract is um, one of the uh, cool features of Windows 8. Uh, there are quite a few contracts available in Windows 8. Uh, for example, allowing you to search in an application or allowing two applications to share with each other, uh, to share data with each other. Um, I'm gonna show you how you can use a contract in combination with MVVM. I'm gonna use the share contract to show it. I could use the other contract as well. I picked the share contract. Now, if you've never seen the share contract, what does the share contract do? It allows you to well, share data from one application to another. Um, normally, sharing, 
between two applications is a process of well copying something to the clipboard or saving something locally and then uploading it in another application. That's how sharing is normally done. In Windows 8, however, you can do sharing using the share contract. And the share contract allows you to do a very lightweight in-context sharing. That's how Microsoft markets it. Uh, now, what does it mean? It is very simple to implement, and it is a very simple implementation of sharing, always consistent between several applications. And in-context means that you don't have to leave the application to share data between two applications. Now, the share contract, of course, happens between two applications that don't have to know each other. And you can share with, with, for example, the email application without knowing what the email application is expecting. Now, the share contract is basically defining what can be shared between the two applications. Sharing happens, therefore, between a source application and a target application. And basically, Windows sits in between. So Windows will actually accept the data and push it to the other application. That's a very simplified way of, of, of explaining the share contract, but that's basically how things work. I think I've mentioned all of these already. So if you look at a schema for the sharing, so you have the source application over there. That's the one that is going to be sharing data. Um, sharing is a contract that you don't have to check as a declaration in your application manifest. No. It's, uh, the reason for that is that sharing happens depending on the page that you're using it on. So uh, you, for example, in my application, I only can share in the detail page. So on the page I can share, I am going to ask Windows, um, that I, I'm going to say to Windows, I'm going to register with something called the Data Transfer Manager. That is a Windows 8 or, or WinRT object, and I'm going to register for the data requested event. And Windows is going to say, okay, I know now that you can share. When the user now says, uh, I'm going to share something, I, I, he clicks on the share charm, then the data requested event is going to be raised in your application. Then your application is going to be building up something called the data package. That is basically uh, a box that it can fill with data. It can put in a text, it can put in images and stuff like that. So then your application says, I'm ready. Then Windows will take a look at the data package, see what it contains, and based on that, build up a list of applications that can work with the data that you've, uh, that you've been sending back. Then the user selects an application to, uh, to work with the data, and then that application gets read access to that data package. That's how sharing works in general. Now, in a Windows, uh, sorry, in an MVVM architecture, as mentioned here, you have a dependency on that data transfer manager. Should you be adding that in your application, in your view model? Because it's going to be the, the task of the view model to say, here we can share and here we cannot share. Well, again, no. This is something that should be handled by a separate service if you're building a shared source. That service is going to take the dependency on that data transfer manager, and your application is only responsible of pushing the data to that, to that uh, share service. And that can then say, now we're going to build up the uh, data when it is requested to do so. Let me show you that in action. So I have in my application the uh, share service. Let's go to the uh, share service first over here. So the share service is again a class that implements an interface, the iShare service, and it has the uh, iRecipe uh, so the shared recipe that it's going to be sharing. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say I'm going to share a particular recipe. So that has to be pushed into this particular class. And the first thing that this, um, that this uh, share service is going to do, it is going to initialize. And that initialization is going to use that data transfer manager. So I'm directly using that data transfer manager in my, um, in my service. Not a problem because this is done in a separate service and not in the view model. I also register for the data requested. I unsubscribe from the data requested should there be another one registered. This is just to make things, uh, if you don't do this, it might look up at some point. So unregister and then register again. Um, this data requested, I actually copied that as well from the original Contoso Cookbook application. It does nothing but building up the data package. So the data package building is also part of this share service. Now, it is my view model that is going to say, now we can share and now we cannot share. So for example, in the uh, share, uh, sorry, in the recipe detail view model, I am going to say what I can share. When I navigate from page one to page two, when I, recipe, when I navigate to this uh, uh, detail page of a recipe, I'm going to say, well, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to use this selected recipe uh, property. And in here, I am going to say share service, shared recipe. That is this one. I'm going to set that equal to the selected recipe. 
So then my share service knows that that is the recipe that we're going to be sharing. However, what I also need to do, and I think that's down here at the bottom somewhere over here, I use this share service dot initialize in the initialization of the view model to make sure that on this particular view, my sharing is going to be enabled. So I say here share service dot initialize, and that is going to call this data transfer manager initialization code. And that is what I'm doing. My view model is simply saying we're going to share, and it is saying to the data service, uh, sorry, to the share service, we're going to be sharing. I push in the data that I want to share, and for the rest, the, the, the dependency on the data transfer manager is entirely pushed into that share service. Again, making sure that my view models are not dependent on the data transfer manager. All right. <clears throat> Now, what about tiles? We all know tiles. Tiles are the, uh, the things that are moving and that are, uh, are changing in my, uh, in my start screen. And there's all kinds of tiles. And you can, of course, create live tiles. And live tiles are basically uh, updating tiles that allow you, uh, your application to give interesting content to the user while he's not actually uh, using your application. Your application might be running and might be pushing updates, or your application might be using push notifications in combination with the cloud. Again, the main goal here is making sure that the user sees updates from your application without your code being executed, without your application running. And there are several ways of updating the tile. The main way of doing it, and let's say the, the easiest way of doing it, is updating the tile from the local code. If you update the tile from the local code, so you're going to use a local tile update in that case, you simply communicate with the tile update manager to say, I want to push this particular tile update to the tile. The tile update itself is nothing more than XML. It is a templated piece of XML that is understood by the, by the tile update manager, by, by Windows, when you push it from your application to the tile. You can also do a local scheduled tile update, which will update after a certain amount of time. Those are some options around local tile updates. Now, if you want to use the cloud in combination, then you can either go for periodic tile updates or push notifications. A periodic tile update will go out to a service and pull that service every now and then for a new tile update in the form, again, of a templated XML. Um, the, the push notification is a push system. And that's the main difference between the two. Polling, so the periodic tile update only goes out every uh, 30 minutes, hour, uh, 12 hours, uh, 6 hours, 12 hours, and 24 hours. A push notification is initiated by a background process on the server that will actually push a templated XML, a piece of XML, to your clients. Now, how do you work with those tasks in your application? It is, again, the same story as, for example, the contracts. It is not the role of the view model to directly, to directly interact with the tiles. It is, however, the role of the view model to say, now we should be pushing a tile update. Now we should be uh, updating the batch, and, and now we should be pushing a, a toast notification. This is not the direct job of the view model. It is the direct job of another service that I'm going to use, another service which is called the tile service, that I'm going to manage again via my container and allowing me to be, to be mocking it out into uh, when I test my class, my view model, in isolation. Let me show you how I do that with tiles. So I have this tile service um, over here. <clears throat> so this is my tile service. And it has two possible uh, ways of doing a local tile update. So I'm using uh, this, uh, this uh, project over here called the, push, the Notifications Extensions, which is part of the Windows 8 SDK. And in that, uh, in that library, there's many classes that build uh, an object model around the XML coming from or, or use, being used in combination with the tile updates. So I'm not building up my XML directly. I'm using the notifications extensions library. However, what I'm also doing, I'm doing the tile update entirely in this particular class. So I'm building up the tile. I'm setting its text. I'm setting the square content, so the, the, the small tile update. And I'm also going to then uh, use the uh, Windows 8 class, the tile update manager, to actually push a tile notification from my local code to my tile. That's what I'm doing here. I'm doing it with a simple text update and a, an image and text update. My view model 
will decide that we have to send a um, tile update. Uh, the very simple uh, solution here is that every time I navigate to a detail page, I update the tile so that when the user is not using the application anymore, he sees what he was last looking at, the recipe he was last, he has last viewed, so he might be enticed to open the application again. That's the main goal and the main idea here. So if we take a look at the uh, setting of the selected recipe again, here in the uh, detail uh, view model, then we see again that I'm using my tile service. I have two implementations here. So I'm gonna send a simple text update, which is simply going to send the, uh, the title of the selected recipe. And of course that tile service is pushed in my view model over here, again, using the DI container. So that's how I interact with tiles. I don't directly use a tile from my, from my view model. I use the tile update manager entirely wrapped into a separate service that I manage through my, uh, my, my that I managed in my uh, DI container. All right. I'm going to skip. No, I should actually have time for the push notifications as well. Now, what if you want to use push notifications in combination with uh, MVVM? Now, push notifications are the same pieces of XML, the same templated XML, but then pushed from uh, WNS, so the Windows Notification Service. Um, of course, I don't have the time to explain you how the entire push notification system works, but I'm gonna give you a very brief overview. So um, push notifications works in combination, uh, or, or is based on a combination between your application and the cloud. Uh, you have your application here, and your application is going to communicate what, with something which is known as the client notification platform. The client notification platform is part of Windows, it is the piece that actually receives the incoming XML messages from the cloud. The first thing that you have to do is communicate with that client notification platform and ask it for something known as the channel URI. That is a unique identification for your application on that device and also linked to the user. It's basically a very long URI. That URI you have to keep track of on your server side because that is the ID of the application on some device that is using your application. So you're gonna send to your own service that channel URI. You're gonna save that somewhere in a database. Now when something happens, so you won't assume that you're building a breaking news application, a background event is firing, and that background event is going to call onto the service and it's gonna say, now we need to push an update to all clients that have been connected that are interested in receiving push notification updates. So it's going to call, uh, it's going to read out the database, it's gonna look to, it's gonna read out all the uh, client notification, uh, sorry, all the uh, uh, channel URIs, I'm sorry, and those channel URIs we now need to write a message to. And I'm gonna do that by now allowing my service to communicate with WNS. And WNS, so that's Windows Notification Service, it's the Windows Azure uh, piece of software that written by Microsoft, that WNS is then going to look for that uh, client and it's going to push the templated XML to the client notification platform, which in turn is going to update your tile. That is how the entire circle in combination with WNS works. Now, how does this work in combination with MVVM? Well, as you can see, m most of the functionality is on the server. The only thing that actually is done on the client is registering uh, with the client notification uh, platform and then sending that channel URI to the service. That's in fact the only thing that is part of your application. And you can probably by now start imagining how I solved this. Well, I created this push notification service, which uh, has this single method register channel URI with service. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Windows, the client notification platform, for my channel URI. And that channel URI is uh, saved over here so that I can copy paste it. I'm not gonna run it. Um, I'm not sure if I still have network. Um, and then the second thing I'm going to do, once I have that channel URI, I'm going to use that channel URI, I'm gonna send it to my service that accepts it and I will save it in the database. So in here, I have my dependency on my, my proxy, so my generated proxy class that I put in this uh, services project. And I'm going to send my channel URI to my uh, server completely wrapped in this particular service. And the only thing that my application is uh, doing is um, uh, over here, no, uh, sorry, I need to use this one. In, uh, da -da 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 -da. I think it's over here. Uh, over here, 
Yeah. So uh, I have when I registered when I used the application. Let's run it very quickly. I have put it in the app bar. There we go. So in the app bar, I can select whether or not I'm interested in uh, receiving push notifications. And when the user says yes, then that individual service is going to be called. So when I say yes, there we go, then we are uh, arriving in this push notification service. I have the channel URI, I will push it to the service then. This is entirely wrapped, the functionality is entirely wrapped inside of this notification service. It is not managed in the uh, view model. The view model is just saying, uh, it's in fact not directly saying uh, go out and, and register. Come on, there we go. It is uh, in this uh, dialog service. In the dialog service, I have the uh, on yes clicked in the dialog, and that is, uh, that is going to go out to the toast service and is going to register the URI with the service. And from then on, the entire push notification uh, system is taken out of the application. It's now entirely running server side, and my application is not bothered with it anymore. So we have seven more minutes. That should be okay. <clears throat> um, Windows 8 applications are not running when the user, um, are not closed when the user leaves them. Windows 8 applications have a completely new life cycle. And that life cycle also can pose a couple of problems when you use it in combination with uh, MVVM. Now quickly, how that, that uh, I'm gonna quickly show you how that, that life cycle works. So an application first is not running. At some point, user will say, I'm gonna run that application, I'm gonna launch it. So then it's going to enter the running state. Once it is running, then the user uh, may switch applications and then Windows will say, now that application doesn't get access to the CPU anymore. It is basically going to enter the suspended state. And when it's being suspended, it cannot do anything on the system, but it remains in memory. It can be resumed from there, but the main problem is that it can also be terminated from there. If, it is, if the user is opening too many applications on the system, then Windows will at some point say, I'm going to kill off a couple of applications, and that might be your application. So the application is gonna be terminated. Now, we as developers how, uh, are, are, have, <coughs> sorry, are responsible for making sure that the user doesn't notice that the application was suspended. The user wants uh, his application to be uh, doing, or, 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 or at least give the impression that it has been running all the time. So that brings the problem to us as developers. We have to make sure that we save the application state between several runs, even if the application was terminated. And we can do that by, uh, on, in the on suspending event, saving the state of the application. We can use for that the application data API, and we can use the local settings, the local folder, the roaming settings, or the roaming folder. It is again not part of the view model to entirely manage this, but this is a bit of a special case. And let me show you. I'm going to, um, again, this is not completely, um, completely implemented. I should build up also the history when the user is going to uh, uh, enter the application again, but I've built a very simple way of managing the state in combination with MVVM. So I have this state service, and this state service has two things, the save state and the load state. And what my idea is that when the user is on a detail page, he leaves the application and he comes back to it, it might have been terminated. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to save when I'm on a detail page on which page I am, on which detail I, or, or recipe ID I'm looking at, and when the application was terminated, then I'm going to automatically uh, open the application showing that particular view model. As mentioned, you should extend this by also adding the entire history, maybe. So uh, this is very simple uh, implementation, but you can extend, you can build on this to make it work in a complete application as well. So this save state is going to use the local settings to save two values, the, uh, the, view, the view name and the parameter. So in the detail, in the recipe detail, when I'm going to, again, this particular uh, selected recipe setter, I am going to say state service at the state, it is gonna be the recipe detail view, and I'm going to save the unique ID. So that is the recipe ID. So then I save that particular ID to the local settings. When the user then returns from termination of the application, we want to redirect the user to the detail page with that recipe already open for him. And I'm gonna do that in the app XAML, in the app XAML over here. In the app XAML, I am going to um, over, uh, no, sorry, over here, uh, in the termination, there we go. So in the termination, 
I'm, uh, sorry, in the on launched, I'm going to check if the application was previously terminated. And if it was terminated, then I am going to say I'm going to load state. So I'm going to call that state service load state. I'm going to check if I can find previously saved detail ID and detail page. And if I do, then I automatically use a navigation service to navigate to the detail view with that recipe already loaded. All right, we have a couple of more minutes left. And the last thing I'm going to show you is unit testing. Now, one of the main goals of this application architecture is making sure that things are testable. The fact that I use a DI container makes sure that my dependencies are not directly inside of my code, but that I can manage them through my container. The fact that I use separation of concerns makes sure that I can test my individual blocks, my view models, my services in isolation, and I don't have a tree of dependencies that, are that I have to uh, include in my tests as well. So instead of talking about it, I'm going to show you how I unit tested my application. So I'm going to test, I have one individual test in here. So in the view models, in the recipe group detail view model, I have this initialized method. And let's assume that you want to unit test this particular method. If we take a look at the constructor of this view model, we see that we are using uh, a recipe data service and a navigation service. The navigation service is not used in the initialize, but uh, I do have to um, mock out the recipe data service. I have to provide a mock implementation because that's what I'm going to unit test. I'm going to test that after the initialization, the selected recipe group is in fact filled up. So in the test project, I have this one unit test. It's actually quite a simple unit test. I'm going to initialize my view model, and then I'm going to uh, call this initialize with a particular uh, parameter Chinese, and then I'm going to check that my selected recipe group on my view model is not null. So I'm using the Microsoft unit testing framework. So I have this class initialize. So I know that this thing will run when the unit test class is being uh, called. Then I have this instance factory uh, register type. So I'm going to use my DI container and I'm going to register with my container, not now the uh, concrete implementations, but I'm going to create um, a fake recipe data service and a fake navigation service. And that I can then use to perform my test. So in this fake recipe data service, which of course also implements the iRecipe data service. I have this, uh, let me put it on two lines here. So I have this um, get all recipe groups method that is going to use something called the fake repository. And that fake repository is a fake implementation of my uh, repository that uh, also returns a observable collection of recipe groups. And that recipe uh, groups, that fake observable collection here, is in fact going to return a list of hard-coded um, recipe groups which all contain a recipe. So what I'm then going to do is, uh, in fact, I've taken you through it. So I'm going to return that fake repository uh, repo uh, recipe groups into my uh, service over here. So I'm going, to I'm going to register the fake recipe data service with my, uh, my uh, container, and then I'm going to call my view model, and that is automatically going to pick up in my unit test that fake recipe data service. And let's, um, do I have it open here? Seems that I've closed it. But that's how I act, in fact, because we're running out of time, that's how I am now capable of creating a unit test in my application that is uh, using, in fact, what I've been trying to achieve, the separation of concerns and the DI container. And so we are at the end of the talk. I hope I've given you a very good overview of um, the fact that it's not only uh, good of building MVVM applications and building Windows 8 applications using MVVM, but I've given you hopefully also uh, a couple of interesting aspects that you will come across in all Windows 8 applications that you build in your career. Um, I hope um, you've enjoyed the uh, talk. Uh, if you have any questions, please come forward. For the rest, I want to thank you. I want to uh, wish you a very pleasant rest of the day. Thank you for being here. and. Um, yeah, okay, thank you for being here, sorry.